this lecture, we are going to be looking at activity-based costing. But before we look at activity-based costing in detail, it's very important for you to understand where everything fits in. So if you look at the diagram just below, you can see we have two different costing methods. We've got variable costing and we also have absorption costing. Now we have already covered this in a previous lecture. You guys will remember we have already looked at variable costing and we have also looked at traditional absorption costing. In today's lecture, we are going to be looking at activity-based costing. But it's very important for you to understand that activity-based costing is also absorption costing. So with absorption costing, we can either use traditional absorption costing, which we have already looked at, or we can use activity-based costing. Now it's important for you to understand that the difference between these various costing methods is in the treatment of our fixed overheads. We know with variable costing, our fixed overheads are expensed in the period incurred. On the other hand, with absorption costing, our fixed overheads are included in the value of inventory. So the difference between the various costing methods is in the treatment of our fixed overheads. So before we look at activity-based costing in more detail, let's first recap variable costing and traditional absorption costing, which we have already covered in a previous lecture. So we know with variable costing, our fixed manufacturing costs are treated as period costs, they are not included in inventory valuation, but instead they are expensed in the period that they are incurred. Then with traditional absorption costing, we know that instead of expensing our fixed manufacturing costs in the period incurred, they are allocated to products. So in other words, our fixed manufacturing costs are included in inventory valuation instead of being expensed. So what did we look at in previous lectures where we covered traditional absorption costing? You guys will remember I gave you four steps that you need to work through when we are allocating any fixed manufacturing costs to our products. And in step one, I said to you, you are going to calculate your allocation rate. And we calculate our allocation rate by taking our budgeted fixed manufacturing cost and dividing by normal capacity. Now the reason why we use normal capacity, you will remember that absorption costing complies with IAS 2. And in terms of IAS 2, fixed manufacturing costs must be allocated to the cost of products based on normal capacity. So that complies with IAS 2. You will also remember that I told you if normal capacity is not given, you can use the budgeted capacity for the year. So at the beginning of each year, we calculate an allocation rate. We take our budgeted fixed cost for the entire year and we divide by normal capacity. Then in step two, we calculate our absorbed cost. And you'll remember we calculate the absorbed cost by taking our allocation rate and multiplying by actual production. And it's the absorbed cost which is taken to cost of sales and which we use in order to value inventory. Then at the end of the year, we calculate variances. First, we calculate an expenditure variance. And your expenditure variance is just the difference between the actual cost and the budgeted cost. And in addition to that, we also calculate a volume variance. And the volume variance is the difference between the budgeted cost 
and the absorbed cost that we calculated over here in step two. So that's just a recap of our lecture on variable and absorption costing. Now it's important to note that when we calculate this allocation rate at the beginning of the year, we calculate a single overhead rate for the organization as a whole. So we take the total budgeted fixed manufacturing costs for the company as a whole and we calculate one single overhead rate. In addition to that, please note that overheads are allocated to products on an arbitrary basis. Or another way to look at this is on a random basis. So what do I mean by this? We don't analyze what this budgeted fixed manufacturing cost is made up of. Now remember, your budgeted fixed manufacturing cost includes all of your fixed manufacturing overheads. So it includes things like depreciation on your factory machines, insurance on any of your factory equipment or your factory buildings, water and electricity that's used in your factory, any ordering costs associated to ordering raw materials, any setup costs that are incurred when you are setting up the factory in order to produce, or when you have to change the setup of the factory when you go from producing one product to another product, any rent that you incur on your factory buildings, any quality control costs, all of those are fixed manufacturing costs which we need to allocate to the cost of inventory. However, when we perform this calculation, we never analyzed what this budgeted fixed manufacturing cost is made up of. We just take the total cost for the year and we divide by normal capacity and we use that in order to allocate our fixed manufacturing cost to our products. So we either use as normal capacity over here, we either use units, machine hours, or labor hours. So this is done on an arbitrary or a random basis, and there is no cause and effect relationship. So in other words, we don't analyze what the cost is made up of and try and look for appropriate cost drivers. Instead, we just randomly use units, machine hours, or labor hours. And it's important to note that machine hours, labor hours, or the number of units manufactured are all volume-based measures. So when we use traditional absorption costing, we are allocating our fixed manufacturing costs to products using volume-based measures. So what does that mean? A volume-based measure means if my production volume increases, then the cost should also increase. Or on the other hand, if your production volume decreases, then the cost should decrease. Those are all volume-based measures. Let's look at an example just below. Let's assume that we have a company which calculates the depreciation on machinery based on machine usage. So in other words, the more they use the machine, the higher the depreciation expense for the year will be. So that is going to be volume-based because if the company produces more units in this year, so in other words, if their production volume increases, the depreciation expense is going to increase because if production volume increases, the company is going to have more machine hours and that will result in a higher depreciation expense. On the other hand, if your production volume for the year decreases, then machine hours will decrease and the company will have a lower depreciation expense for that year. Now please note, this is a depreciation expense based on machine usage. This is not straight line depreciation. So I do just need to discuss this in a bit more detail, otherwise you guys are gonna get a bit confused. Remember, with straight line depreciation, what happens? Let's say, for example, we have a company that buys a machine with a cost of 200,000 Rand, and they tell you the machine is going to be depreciated over a period of 10 years. That means my depreciation is going to be 20,000 Rand per annum. That is straight line depreciation. So please note, then it does not matter what your production volume for the year is. It doesn't matter if the company produces 10 units, 20 units, 30 units, or 100 units. 
your depreciation expense is going to be 20,000 Rand per annum. So please note, just make this very clear in your head. I am not talking about straight line depreciation because that doesn't make any sense. If it's straight line depreciation, it's going to be, in this example, 20,000 Rand per annum regardless of the number of units that are manufactured. So I'm not talking about straight line depreciation. Please note, I am talking about depreciation based on machine usage. So in other words, the company is depreciating the machine based on the number of machine hours. The more they use the machine, the higher the depreciation expense will be. The less they use the machine, the lower the depreciation expense will be. So this is depreciation based on machine usage. That's very important for you to understand. Then, because the depreciation is calculated based on machine usage, it makes sense to use machine hours to allocate the cost. So machine hours is an appropriate cost driver to allocate your depreciation based on machine usage. And the logic is because if the company produces more units, or in other words, their production volume increases, then your machine time is going to increase or your machine hours will increase, resulting in an increase in your depreciation cost because if you use the machine more, it's going to result in the machine depreciating. The opposite is also true. If production volume decreases, then the company will use their machines less during that year and their machine hours will be lower, resulting in a lower depreciation expense. So it makes sense to use machine hours as a cost driver when we are allocating depreciation based on machine usage. On the other hand, if we are trying to allocate machine setup costs to products, then it is not appropriate to use machine hours as a cost driver. Why is it not appropriate to use machine hours as a cost driver for setup costs? Because setup costs are not volume related, meaning your setup cost has got nothing to do with production volume. If my production volume increases or decreases, that has no impact on my setup costs. Your setup costs are going to change depending on the number of setups. So remember guys, a setup cost just means the company needs to set the factory up or lay it out in a certain way for production. And if a company makes different products, they often need to change the setup of the factory when they go from making one product to another product. So every time they have to set the factory up, they incur these setup costs. So setup costs are going to depend on the number of setups during the year and not on production volume. So it doesn't make sense to allocate setup costs to your products using machine hours or using a volume-based measure. So please note, it's important for you to understand right now at this point. If we are using traditional absorption costing, with traditional absorption costing, we use volume-based measures in order to allocate our fixed manufacturing costs to products, meaning we use machine hours, labor hours, or the number of units manufactured. Those are all volume-based measures. And it's appropriate to use volume-based measures or volume-based cost drivers when activities are performed each time a unit is produced. Or in other words, when a change in your production volume will impact your cost. So it made sense to allocate your depreciation based on machine usage using machine hours as a cost driver because any change in your production volume, so if your production volume changes, that will affect your machine hours and that will have a direct impact on your cost. So for depreciation based on machine usage, it makes sense to use a volume-based cost driver to allocate the cost, or it makes sense to use machine hours to allocate the cost. On the other hand, if we are trying to allocate setup costs, your setup costs do not depend on your production volume. They don't vary with production volume. Setup costs are going to depend on the number of setups during the year. So it doesn't make sense to use a volume-based cost driver to allocate setup costs to products. Instead, the cost should be allocated 
based on the number of setups. In other words, we should use a cost driver that is not volume related. Now guys, companies incur lots of different costs in their manufacturing process. Some of the costs are volume related, and if they are volume related, it's fine to use volume related cost drivers. We can then use machine hours, labor hours, number of units. But other costs are not volume related. So here are a few examples of costs that are not volume related. Product design, quality control, production planning, ordering, production setups, dispatching and customer services. So for all of these costs, because they are not volume related, we cannot allocate these costs using volume based cost drivers. It would be inappropriate and it would result in incorrect costing of products. Instead of using machine hours, labor hours, number of units, we should rather look at things like the number of setups when we are trying to allocate the setup cost. If we are trying to allocate the quality control cost, we should look at the number of inspections. If we are trying to allocate the ordering cost, we should look at the number of orders. So that's where activity-based costing comes in. Instead of just allocating costs using volume-based measures, we are also going to allocate costs using non-volume-based measures where it makes sense. And that is going to result in a lot more accurate costing of products. So let's look at a summary of everything we've covered on this page. We said with traditional absorption costing, we calculate one allocation rate or a single allocation rate for the company as a whole. This blanket rate over here. We said that that rate is calculated on an arbitrary or a random basis. We don't look at what the overhead cost is made up of and try and identify appropriate cost drivers where there's a cause and effect relationship. Instead, we just use units, machine hours, or labor hours. And in addition to that, we only use volume-based measures. Volume-based measures being units, machine hours, and labor hours. On the other hand, with activity-based costing, instead of only calculating one single allocation rate for the company as a whole, we are going to now calculate many activity rates. So we are going to look at what the overhead cost is made up of, and for all of the different types of overhead costs, we are going to calculate different activity rates. This is not going to be done on an arbitrary basis. Instead, we are going to look at the nature of the cost, and we are going to identify an appropriate cost driver where there's a cause and effect relationship. In other words, we won't just use machine hours, units, or labor hours, even if it doesn't make sense. We will only use those if it makes sense. So in other words, if we are trying to allocate the cost of machine depreciation, which is based on machine usage, then it makes sense to use machine hours. On the other hand, if we are trying to allocate setup costs, we won't use machine hours. We will then use the number of setups. If we are trying to allocate ordering costs, we'll use the number of orders, etc. So we will look at a cause and effect relationship. We won't just have an arbitrary basis of allocation. And lastly, we won't only use volume-based measures, but we'll use a mix of volume and non-volume-based measures. So we might use units, labor hours, and machine hours if it makes sense to use volume-based measures. However, if it doesn't make sense to use volume-based measures, then we won't use volume-based measures. Then we will look at things like the number of setups, the number of inspections, the number of orders, etc. So that's the difference between traditional absorption costing and activity-based costing. Please note that both of them are absorption costing,
So with both of them, we are including our fixed costs in the cost of inventory. On the other hand, with variable costing, our fixed costs are just expensed in the period incurred. So the only difference between all of these costing methods is in the treatment of our fixed overheads.